Hello, welcome to BBC World News. I'm Ben Boulos. Later today, a funeral service will take place for Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. Let's take you to the scene live in Windsor, just west of London. And the funeral uh, has been scaled back because of COVID uh, restrictions. It will be a ceremonial royal funeral and will reflect the Duke's own wishes, said to have described wanting a minimum of fuss. The service will mark his unwavering loyalty to the Queen, as well as his long association with the Royal Navy, and his love of the sea will also be a focus. There will be no sermon given, there will be no eulogy, and there will be no family readings. In fact, the total number of people present in St George's Chapel in the grounds of Windsor Castle will be just 30, the Queen and 29 other close family and friends. There will be a procession through the grounds of Windsor Castle. A small group of family members will walk through the castle grounds in that procession. The royal family have released a montage to commemorate the Duke of Edinburgh. In the message, they paid tribute to what they described as an extraordinary life made unique by its sheer breadth of experience. This is the montage. It includes photos, plenty of photos from throughout the years, as well as an original work by the Poet Laureate, Simon Armitage, who's written a poem to mark the Duke's passing. We'll have coverage of the events in Windsor throughout the day here on BBC World News, and we can join my colleague Jane Hill in Windsor right now. You're watching BBC News. I'm Jane Hill at Windsor Castle as the nation prepares to remember the Duke of Edinburgh. His funeral takes place here in St George's Chapel this afternoon. The funeral will mark Prince Philip's unwavering loyalty to the Queen and his service to the nation. The Duke's association with the Royal Navy and his love of the sea will be a focus of the ceremony. Many aspects of today's service were planned by the Duke himself. His many medals and decorations have been placed in the chapel and more than 730 members of the armed forces will take part in a procession. The selection of which units, which bands, which music, which medals will be there. So it is very much his funeral designed by him. There's a limit of 30 mourners in St George's Chapel because of Covid rules. The Queen and the Duke's four children and their eight grandchildren will all be present. And before this afternoon's funeral, the Queen has shared this, one of her favourite photographs of her and her husband relaxing in the Scottish Highlands. The service itself will begin after a national minute silence at three o'clock this afternoon, Buckingham Palace has urged members of the public not to travel to Windsor. It's asking people to follow this afternoon's ceremony on radio and television. Hello and welcome again to Windsor Castle, where the funeral of the Duke of Edinburgh will take place this afternoon, watched by millions of people in this country and around the world. It will be relatively a small family affair because, of course, it, the funeral service has to run in line with COVID restrictions. And that means only 30 people are allowed inside St George's Chapel. And the Queen will sit alone as she says goodbye to her husband of 73 years. Buckingham Palace says the service will celebrate and reflect the Duke's life and mark his unwavering loyalty to the Queen. Today we're hearing from people who knew the Duke and those involved in the planning of today's events. Our first report is from our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. 
a husband and wife, a photograph from the Queen's private collection, an image from a strong marriage, and a reminder that today there is a wife saying farewell to a beloved partner of 73 years. Inside Windsor Castle, St George's Chapel has been made ready. The Duke of Edinburgh's many decorations have been placed on the altar. Close by, the seat he used to occupy. The enamelled stall plate is still in place, but his insignia as a Knight of the Garter has been removed. It will be in this section of the chapel, known as the choir, where the 30 members of the congregation will be seated, around the catafalque bearing the Duke's coffin. The funeral procession will have made its way to the chapel from the castle's quadrangle. Just after 2.40, his coffin will be borne from the state entrance to be placed on the Land Rover hearse the Duke helped to design. At 2.45, the small procession will step off for the eight-minute journey through the castle. Some members of the royal family will walk behind the coffin. The Queen will follow in a limousine. At 2.53, the coffin will arrive at the west steps of St George's Chapel. It will be borne to the top of the steps where it will pause. At three o'clock, a one-minute silence will be observed before the coffin enters the chapel for the funeral service, which will be presided over by the Archbishop of Canterbury. As with all funerals, there's a huge sense of privilege that you're with the family, any family, at this remarkable point in their lives where they're grieving someone they loved profoundly. And then with this funeral, there is also that extra sense of huge privilege, but also pride in his life. The pride is not that I'm there. The pride is here we are celebrating such a wonderful life. Within the chapel, the order of service will proceed precisely as the Duke had prescribed. He chose the music and the readings. There's a lot in there that, that is very him. You know, we've got uh, a Land Rover that's been designed by him. He's taken a personal interest in every aspect of it, but, but in particular, the selection of which units, which bands, which music, which medals will be there. So it is very much his funeral designed by him. The service will end with the lowering of his coffin to the royal vault below the chapel. Royal Marine buglers will sound the last post and then action stations, a reminder of the Duke's years of service in the Royal Navy, a reminder too that he was a royal consort with a difference, distinctive to the end. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. Well, in preparation for this afternoon's funeral service itself, we are just hearing that the Duke of Edinburgh's coffin covered with a wreath and with his sword, his naval cap and his personal standard has now been moved by a bearer party uh, from Windsor Castle's private chapel to the inner hall and crucially of course we call, we talk a lot about the armed forces involvement in all of today's ceremonial events and we are hearing that uh, that has been moved by a bearer party from the Queen's Company 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards um, a, a regiment that the Duke of Edinburgh had a, a close association with so that is uh, just one other formal element of today's proceedings in the run-up to the funeral service itself which will take place a little later this afternoon here at Windsor Castle uh, after the procession that we have been speaking about as well and we will be talking to members of the military here over the course of the day as well. But uh, for now let's speak again to the royal biographer and historian Robert Lacey, a follower, close follower of the royal family for very many years and has written extensively uh, about the royal family and Robert you and I have been reflecting on the fact that everything that we will see here in Windsor this afternoon has, in fact, as the head of the army said yesterday, it has, as he put it, uh, the Duke's fingerprints on it. This is something that he wished for. Yes, um, and you talked, Jane, about the two families by which I think you referred to the royal family and then the military family. But of course, there is a third family, and that's all of us who are participating today. Um, the military element is very important, but I was so interested how before the hour 
you were talking to um, someone involved in the DOE scheme, Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. Amazed to hear, well, not amazed to hear, interested to hear that you were involved in it yourself. Um, and um, we've talked about it before, but I, I do think it's emblematic of so much um, that mattered about the Duke um, and it says something about the, the, sorry, the, the, the royal family as a whole. Um, when you think of it, something like the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, which you said has now affected millions of people around the world, um, uh, bringing all sorts of, well, you said you hated camping out in the cold, but bringing the outdoor life to um, people in, in urban situations, often deprived areas, giving a new dimension to their life. When you think about it, that's the sort of thing that a government ought to do or a edu Ministry of Education ought to do. But actually, it's, it, it's the idea of this member of the royal family, Prince Philip, way back in the 1950s, um, when that sort of thing wasn't thought of. Um, this is a man who has really, I mean, one must avoid um, superlatives or getting excessive when talking about the royal family on an occasion like this, but this was a man who really has changed the character of Britain and um, in, in a positive way, uh, both in national terms, but also in the way he, you know, he got royal ceremonies staged and televised, but then, as we say, also in terms of touching everybody's life and, and making our life, I think one can say, better. And um, so there is something to, for everybody, not just the family, not just the military family, to remember and reflect on this afternoon. Yes, and I, I, I don't wish to claim anything that I that I'm uh, didn't do, Robert. And uh, anyone you I know will, uh, will will tell you that I do not do anything that involves standing out in the cold. So that element I would like to stress was was not for me. So I don't want to claim well, something that I wasn't out in engaged the cold with. But moment, I'm really James, interested in. <laughs> Well, um, in terms of the, the success of the scheme, and we heard from a, a wonderful, passionate young man just a little earlier talking about the benefits that he'd seen in his local community in Bournemouth. Uh, of course, I want to ask, as someone who, who spoke to the Duke and wrote about him, was he proud of the Duke of Edinburgh scheme? Was he really delighted with what it achieved? Uh, and, and I know he's someone who, who, who didn't engage even in that sort of um, emotion, but I, but I am interested to know from you what, what you got from him about the scheme and, and whether he was delighted with it. Well, I spoke to him about it in 1970, um, in, the, in 1976, just before the Silver Jubilee of 77. I was interviewing him then about the whole previous 25 years. And interesting you ask that, because when I got onto the subject of um, the DOE scheme, um, well, he didn't shy away from it. Um, he, 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 was, he talked very happily and reflectively about um, all the young people he'd met um, and the difference it had made to their life and this general idea that um, kids cooped up in towns could get out in the countryside, the idea that um, at any age well, uh, young people need challenges, uh, old-fashioned term perhaps, um, but uh, th that he felt was very important. But, um, and he was eloquent on it until we got on to the question of where he got the idea from. Um, uh, and was it something to do with having gone to Gordonston um, the, the school in the Highlands with its, with its outdoor ethic. And at that point he slowed down. He didn't really want to get involved in his own particular role. He didn't want to take credit for it. And um, transferring that modesty of his to the role he played beside the Queen, um, you know, he was always, it's a cliche I know, one step behind the Queen. Um, and that was a physical thing, um, symbolic thing, but a, a very real thing that as we're seeing these last few days, um, week, um, uh, he, he transformed so many aspects of the monarchy and what it did and kept it relevant um, to national life. Um, but never did he want to put his own imprint upon it. He, he, um, he, he, he stood back from it. And um, I suppose the fact that today's ceremony will be in many ways quiet and modest and, and not a grand event is not just because of Covid but basically because that's how it, he wanted it to be. 
Robert, for now, thank you very much. Robert Lacey, the royal author and historian. And uh, there is a lot that Robert was mentioning there that, in fact, I think we'll be able to pick up on with Charles Anson, who I'm pleased to say joins me now, who was, of course, the Queen's press secretary from 1990 to 1997. Charles Anson, thank you for joining us. And you must have worked very closely with the Duke of Edinburgh. Um, can I just ask you, first of all, for your personal reflections here today on a sad day? Well, of course, it's, it's a sad day, but it's also an opportunity to pay tribute to a remarkable man and consort to the Queen, such a wide range of interests. And I think um, I was press secretary between 1990 and 97. It was one of the more difficult periods of the Queen's reign. And Prince Philip was a steady presence, as always, uh, uh, with the Queen through those quite difficult years but also someone who was interested in ideas and, and interested in talking about how to make things better, whether it was for young people in the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, whether it was the environment or a group of scientists. Uh, he had an interest in ideas as well as in doing things and was always very modest about it. I think you know, he was driven by public duty, as is the Queen, and that was sort of a, a foundation. Um, uh, of their marriage, their commitment to public service and enjoyment of public service. And one saw that all the time on a walkabout or on a state visit. Um, they were a pleasure to work for. And Prince Philip was always open to discussion. And if one went to see him about a problem, he, I find you always emerged with you know, a few more ideas and a better understanding of what might be a good way forward. And he was always ready to consider new ideas. He was a modernizer as well as a polymath, he wanted to get things done, but he was also tremendously interested in ideas, and that was stimulating if you were working um, for the monarchy and the royal family. And, that, and, I, and I'm interested that you say that he was a practical person as well as an ideas person. Is he someone who would, would, would come to you and, and your team and he, wouldn't, and he would say, I've got an idea to do X, Y, Z, but he would also understand how that idea would have to be executed. Did he, did he he'd see something through to its natural conclusion? Yes, he would. He would definitely see th things through, and also conceptualise. He was. Uh, he was. A he had a strategic mind, but also a great eye for detail. And partly that, of course, came from his naval career. You know, running a ship, you need to be meticulous in how it runs and uh, and how you treat people in a confined environment. And of course, that breeds a sort of camaraderie. And I think. Uh, one of the joys of working for the Queen and Prince Philip is that they were such a, a good team together and so different. The Queen more reserved and uh, obviously um, very neutral uh, in, in her approach, uh, fair and neutral in her approach as a constitutional monarch. But Prince Philip had that sort of little extra room for manoeuvre and I think with his naval background and the camaraderie of uh, that career in the Navy, you know, made him very... Uh, easy around people and uh, he broke the ice well on big formal occasions and uh, would uh, it took an interest in everybody whatever age they were whatever background he was curious uh, about people and uh, you know really interested in ideas he had a, a huge faith as does the queen um, but he also had an interest in faith and not just the christian religion he had an interest in many other religions I mean, he had been in the Greek Orthodox Church as a child, but he took a great interest in the other religions, and of course that's been inherited by the Prince of Wales. And I think everyone with whom he was involved in his charities, 800 charities over his lifetime he was a patron of, or his family, you know, his ideas rubbed off on, on other people. So he, he enabled change in a big way, but he also gave to his children and his grandchildren a lot of um, his love of public service uh, and love of the, the, the armed services and the life of the contribution of the armed services. But as well as that, there's interest in other ideas. I think he was a, a polymath and his, his interest was sort of eclectic, really, and such a wide range of things he was able to devote his energies to. As well, of course, as his primary task of always being there for the Queen on good and bad occasions. Of course, he went through many packet times, but also through some difficult times uh, 
of the monarchy of the reign of her mom, nearly 70 years. It's an astonishing thing to have been at her side and part of her role all those years. I'm sure the Queen will reflect on that with her own faith as well today. A sad moment, but also a rather marvellous thing to see the whole world pay tribute to him. Charles Anson, thank you for your time, former press secretary to the Queen.